and to be a lawyer for a lifetime. That changed as time passed and conditions changed. Uh, but I started my first law practice, uh, oh gosh, uh, as an individual on Sacramento Street in about 1978 in an old Victorian. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco. I wanted to be close to where I grew up and I wanted uh, the opportunity to give personal service to my clients uh, in a way that would be hard to do if you're in a downtown firm. Agreed. I started, uh, I continued as a lawyer and strictly as a lawyer, oh gosh, until the early 90s. And mm -hmm. what happened to me was that uh, my practice at that time was primarily other attorneys and law firms. Uh -huh. And something happened that was unusual and it changed my outlook on life. And that was that in about 1992 there was a recession. The, the uh, legal industry felt it quite strongly, mm -hmm. and uh, that year I had five clients, lawyers, mm -hmm. who either quit the practice of law or left the state of California. That was a singular event. I'd never seen anything like that before, and I started asking around to friends at other law firms, managing partners, and the like, and I heard the same story over and over again, and that's that the practice of law was getting more and more difficult. It was getting harder to be successful and adhere to all the new regulations and rules, especially without specializing. And I came to the conclusion that I couldn't always count on the law as my sole means of support. And so, at that point... Sorry, sorry to cut you off. We're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here. So um, it just, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit um, about the that first firm um, before we get to all this. Sure. Um, and I see that I see that we have a, a number of people who are joining us on the line a little bit late. So um, we, if you did just join us late, uh, we were starting off initially with um, talking about Basil's first firm, um, which was in 1978, a, an old Victorian. And I think it's interesting some of your the the lessons that you learned even with that first business. And I think it kind of foreshadowed some of your future businesses. Do uh, you want to talk a little bit about the, the lessons of that first firm? Well, of course. You know, first of all, you have to be happy at what you do. Uh, I don't think that uh, it's, it's easy to be successful if you don't like your work. And if you do like your work, your chances of being successful are greatly enhanced. Uh, secondly, I think that each of us has to feel that our product or our service uh, is valuable and necessary, and it's better in some ways than those offered by competitors. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't try to constantly improve. And I, uh, I look at what other law firms are doing. I look at what other real estate firms are doing all the time. And if I like what they're doing, I copy it. Yeah, uh, it's a very uh, in in this kind of an economy. I think, and for the foreseeable future one always has to be on top of the market, on top of the competition. And we do that by examining what they're doing, how much they're charging, what they're offering, and so on, and uh, try to uh, uh, improve ourselves beyond where we are and continue to improve ourselves beyond where the competition is. And then, so after your the first firm, you <laughs> I found this interesting, you moved on and moved to an old moved into your old neighborhood and your your second location was upstairs from a bagel shop so from the victorian to upstairs from the bagel shop yeah well you know that was actually a good location it was just a block from where i grew up plus everybody knew where the house of bagels was it must have been the <laughs> bagel shop in the uh, in the late 70s and it's in San still there Francisco. yeah i think it is yeah i think it is and it was uh, great for me and uh, you know the lesson I took from that was to stay close to the clients, uh, to uh, examine the market area and see where the competition was. In the 70s, most of the, uh, the lawyers were in the downtown financial district area. Mm -hmm. And there were clients who simply did not want to go downtown. Yeah. And uh, so this was an advantage for us, I think, that uh, 
made our practice a little bit more successful. It seems so uh, simple, right? I mean, you have a community that's not being served, has a need and not being served, and so locate yourself there. But also, you also have the history, the background of having been grown up in this area, so you had, you're already networked in with the community, right? Well, there's that, of course, but also the demographics looked good. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's very easy to ascertain the, ge the demographics of a particular geographic area. You could find out what the on the internet uh, what the income is with a, within a one, three, and five mile radius. Mm. Uh, what the individual income versus the household income is. You can check population density. All kinds of things that would be important for a startup business to know. That's great. I mean, that's that's a tremendous value. I mean, back probably you know as recently as 15 years ago, you probably had to go to the library or who knows, Social Security Administration, whoever kept the statistics. Yeah, in those days there were a few published books which were highly expensive, yeah, uh, and they were difficult to find, and of course they go out of date rather quickly. Uh, today it's so much easier. Yeah. Now, uh, and you mentioned this earlier, so around 1992 you had kind of a wake-up call and you had a, a number of your clients who quit practicing law. Tell me about that a little more. Well, it, as I say, it was a, a singular experience for me. I'd never seen that happen before. and. Uh, uh, it, I, I came to realize that there's an, old, there's an old adage which is true for everyone, and that's that uh, the safest way to be successful is to diversify. Mm -hmm. uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket, and I think that that continues to be true today. Because we live in a time when change is accelerating, economic change, uh, 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 career change, professional regulations, legal changes are all going faster and faster. If you look at the change, for instance, from the 1970s, we didn't have scanners, we didn't have faxes, we didn't even, well, most of us didn't even have dictation equipment. What we had was incredibly slow and cumbersome. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, of course, we have, uh, we have cell phones, we have the internet. Faxes, the, inter the whole internet, yeah. email, all yeah. of that. But back when I started out as a lawyer, all we had were carbon paper. It was carbon paper and messengers. Uh, there was no lawyer advertising. And, and uh, I, I had read a book, I think it was in the early 70s, in my last year at Berkeley, Future Shock by a Professor Alvin Toffler. Uh, and his thesis turned out to be very true, although it wasn't as noticeable back then. But it's come to be obvious, and that's that the pace of change, the rate of change, with all the technological and uh, economic advancements that we have, the, the pace of change has sped up. And so we have to watch the market and our, our industries and careers much more carefully than we used to because change happens faster. Right. And a lot of people have been hurt by not keeping their eye on that change. I'm sure there's plenty of businesses, you, th you hear about them all the time, that, do, that fail to innovate, you know, like that find success or, or industries even like CDs or businesses like Blockbuster Video that are tremendously successful but then they miss the boat on, you know, instant streaming or, or whatnot. So, Well, when I was a young lawyer, look at the legal profession, the, 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 the standard in those days was that you join a firm you stay with the firm for your entire career and you retire. There were no such things as firm splits, firm mergers, firm bankruptcies. Uh, the pace of change was rather staid. Uh, that has all changed and I think all of us, no matter what we do in life, have to be cognizant of that change. So we're going to get into talking about, you know, other, uh, the other, uh, you talked a little bit about this already, your diversification strategy, and, and you basically decided that you know, having all your eggs in the basket of practicing law was, was too, um, too much of a pigeonhole. It was too risky. Yeah, too risky, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and that's the case. So what I, I decided to do in about 1992 was to uh, invest in something new or to create a new business each year from then on yeah. in an attempt to spread my 
assets out and my income uh, to diversify my income, and I, I pretty much I've done that. Yeah. Yeah, um, and so you, I found this interesting. So natural transition from you know running a law firm to starting a gas station. So tell us, <laughs> tell us about well, this experience. Yeah, first of all, lawyers have a unique opportunity to uh, observe what succeeds and what doesn't in a variety of businesses and industries. We often preside over autopsies. It mm -hmm. might be a partnership dissolution, it might be a business failure, it might be a contract dispute. Whatever it is, uh, we have an opportunity to examine what caused the business failure. And of course, there are occasions when we have the opportunity to see what succeeds. Well, I wasn't involved in gas stations at all at that time, but I did, uh, I was familiar with some of the laws that involved the regulation of gas stations, and in particular some federal laws that pertain to major oil companies having to offer to their manage, station managers mm -hmm. uh, the first right to purchase a station that they were closing. And that came up with someone I knew and I got involved in that and was able to partner with the station manager and with a, a general contractor partner of mine at the time to purchase the station at what was a below market price and to operate it for a period of years. It was essentially a, a real estate deal. I wasn't involved in the day-to-day -day running of the station. Uh, uh, the station wasn't particularly profitable. We were being squeezed by a, a major oil company, and because it was a single station, we did not have the economies of scale. So essentially, so because uh, even though you had no background in running a gas station, you brought in people to do the actual running of it. You brought in a general contractor to renovate the station, and it was your background knowledge of the law that provided that allowed for someone to buy the the business um, that that you saw that business opportunity and then you ran with it. Yeah, there there were cleanup requirements and we were able to uh, require the uh, selling oil company to clean up the uh, toxicity in the ground there, and then with my general partner we renovated the station put in all new equipment and tanks and uh, were able to start with essentially a clean uh, environmental slate. And uh, so we operated the station for a number of years and then sold it uh, to uh, a chain of gas stations uh, and that's where our real profit was there. And did you have families and friends who questioned this decision? <laughs> all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all the time. And, and, you know, the, the, you always uh, want to respond positively to questions because they're there to help. Yeah. Uh, at, there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's only stupid answers. So <laughs> when people raise questions like that, it, it's an opportunity to take another look at the particular investment and question uh, whether or not it's a prudent thing to do. Now I want to do a quick poll here for everyone who's on the line. I'm curious what types of companies people are involved in um, just so we can kind of get a sense of what uh, you know, what different areas people are in, uh, are in, um, and so we can just kind of run over. You mentioned some of these, but these are some of the lessons from running a gas station. You want to just run over those? Sure. Uh, first of all, it it is unwise to enter into a field with which one has no familiarity. And the way to get around that, of course, is to educate yourself, but also to partner with those who have experience in that industry, in that field, in that service. Uh, you know, I was able to offer my legal expertise. My contractor partner was able to do the, the renovation and oversee the toxic cleanup. Uh, and the station manager was there for day-to-day -day operational expertise. And so we each contributed what we could to the venture, and it worked out to be more successful than it would have been otherwise. I never would have entered into the gas station business without, without my experienced partners there.
Yeah, probably wouldn't have been a good idea. So, yeah. so th this is a natural transition. So you you started a law firm, then you started a gas station, and then you move on to a restaurant <laughs> chain. So, <laughs> tell me right. how that came about. I mean, who who said, uh, you know, who gave you a, the idea of investing in a restaurant chain? Well, uh, understand that uh, I grew up in San Francisco. My dad was a CPA for 40 years there, and most of his clients were restaurants. And I always understood that the last thing on earth you want to do is to open or invest in a restaurant. The failure rate is 90% or so within three years. It's a very difficult uh, thing to get involved in. In this particular case, my stockbroker and my contractor partner and I uh, promised that we would show up at a presentation by a friend of my stockbrokers and that we would leave promptly. But uh, I was very impressed with the credentials of uh, the CEO of this venture and his experience and his uh, the portfolio that he had prepared was very meticulous and detailed. And so that was all very impressive and we decided to go in on it. Uh, and again, we more or less partnered with the, uh, the fledgling restaurant and offered our individual expertises to it and it worked out uh, very well over time. We went from a single location up to six at the, uh, at the beginning of the recession down to four now, but they're all doing well. So you did, you know, although it was a new venture, it was someone who had deep experience within the restaurant space at the time. Oh, exactly. We had two partners that were critical. Uh, the CEO was a Stanford MBA who had been the uh, CFO of Il Fornaio and was at the time the CEO of Gordon Biersch Brewing Company restaurant chain. And also we had a superb French uh, executive chef and, and they were the key partners in the, in the venture and they, uh, they have done a superb job. And the, the idea was that you start one and you move on and, and you know, repeat well, the idea somewhere else. Oh, absolutely. Uh, cookie cuttering is, is the thing of the day. Uh, you know, all franchises are based upon that. Once you perfect a concept, uh, you duplicate it in different locations. And uh, uh, I think that that is the essence of the franchise industry. And what was it about the two locations that you had to close that didn't work out? Well, I think that they were... Uh, they were some. They weren't in the proper demographic areas. Uh, the income level wasn't quite high enough, or in, in one case, the competition was very tough. There were a lot of restaurants in the area, okay. so uh, it, it's it's tough to break into a new area with a new restaurant. And. and you told me a, 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 some stories about, um, I had asked you previously about if they knew you, and you said that you came into some of the, some of the restaurants, they recognized you, they knew you, sometimes you came in and they didn't recognize you, so you could see what it's really like if you're not an owner or an investor in the company. And, um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah we, would, we would always report back to the managing partner and let them know, gee, the service was great or there was a problem here. In essence, uh, we were, you know, as, as often as we could, undercover. Uh -huh. And that's a good way to, especially in a restaurant business, it's a good way to find out whether the customer satisfaction is high or not. Yeah. And so you, after investing in Left Bank, you move on to the next natural, natural logical thing, which is an aquarium. So tell me, <laughs> tell me about how this idea came about and, and how you got involved in, in starting the Aquarium by the Bay in San Francisco. Well, yeah, let me say first off that uh, I uh, genuinely believe that people learn more from their mistakes than from their successes. And this was one of those things that was a mistake. I got involved again at the behest of a, my stockbroker, mm -hmm. and it looked like it was going to be highly successful. It had been in other locations. Uh, in, in this particular case, you know, I had no expertise, and uh, also I had no control over it. And those two things were a factor, plus the fact that we were dealing with an overseas company. Uh, and coming to San Francisco, uh, an overseas company may not really understand the politics of the area or the demographics. And I think that was an issue here. 
we had to deal with the city and county of San Francisco uh, for this particular venture, and they put a lot of restrictions on us that should have been realized as uh, as not being beneficial to our overall success. Uh, in this particular case, the city wanted local flora and fauna, and in truth, local flora and fauna were not particularly colorful or interesting to tourists at Pier 39. And they also put restrictions on our size, the size of the aquarium. So we had issues there. And of course, at a place like Pier 39, you have relatively high rent, and you have to charge a fair amount of money. And it's, uh, uh, it's going to be harder to be successful when you have less colorful and interesting uh, fish to offer and uh, a relatively small site for the aquarium. So that was a, 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 learning, uh, a learning topic for me that you, know, you always have to deal with planning issues, zoning issues, and political issues whenever you do anything new in any particular location. And it helps to know that location, uh, the politics, the politicians well before you get involved in trying to do something major. It's unfortunate that the politics got in the way and those sorts of uh, limits um, in, in terms of the size and the restriction on only having local fish because you actually had an interesting angle on, on this aquarium which was a particular type of plastic which allowed for a different type of tank. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Because I well, think that's it, interesting from a market differentiation. It's not your, it wasn't your normal aquarium from the beginning. Right. What was exciting about this at the time was that uh, in New Zealand, uh, uh, the founder had developed a new kind of plastic that would was very strong and would allow for multi-story aquariums so that people could actually walk through uh, tunnels within the aquarium and look up and look at either side and be surrounded by the fish. So the, the actual product was terrific and it's worked very successfully in New Zealand and in Michigan and other places, but uh, the particular setup here uh, just wasn't uh, prone to be successful because people had a lot of, the tourists at Pier 39 had a lot of distractions there and they had a lot of different places they could spend money and um, we were given restrictions that were uh, not applied in other geographic areas. And um, so we got a bunch of different responses from the little informal poll here about the type of uh, companies that people are involved in. We got people who have a cafe, work in a law firm, work in a bakery, uh, have a health club, grocery store, marketing, consulting, tennis instructor, restaurant, so a, a wide variety. But what are your thoughts on how that that particular, the, the plastic product, which allowed you to differentiate yourself and how that can be applied for people in other types of, uh, you know, companies and, and industries. I mean, is, would you, looking back, do you think that that was, um, you know, is that a strategy that you'd employ like in a cafe having, having something that's completely different from what everyone else has? Well, it depends upon the individual situation, but if you have a unique or rare product, then of course it's going to enhance your chance for success, but you have to make sure that the public demand is there. But always look at that particular product in relation to uh, what the cost is going to be for the public. It, it may not help to have a, a, a singular product that is so highly priced that it's only going to appeal to a limited population. So not only does the product have to be unusual or unique or better than others, it's got to be priced in a way that uh, uh, you can make sure that it will appeal to a sufficient number of people. And that's why the preliminary analysis in any new business is critical. Uh, I think that one should anticipate conservative numbers uh, in terms of product sales and public interest. Yeah. Uh, and if uh, the price point is such that you can still succeed uh, th with conservative numbers, then it's likely to uh, be a success. Now, the other thing is that for people who aren't, uh, don't have a great deal of technical or industry experience, I think it's important these days to go low-tech to uh, establish businesses 
that are relatively simple, not highly technical, not heavily regulated. Uh, that can be done by a certain percentage of, of entrepreneurs, but not all. The chances for success are greatly enhanced if it's a low-tech business. Because you don't you have the technological problems that you might have? Exactly. The technological, yeah. regulatory, scientific, engineering, and so on issues. Yeah. Uh, they're all very important. So for those people who are starting up, a low-tech business or service is uh, usually a, a better bet for success. Later on, once people have acquired sufficient experience in the industry or service, they may want to offer more advanced products or services, but not in the beginning. Yeah, and actually I had a, um article on my blog a little while ago about those types of businesses that people could start easily that are low-tech businesses like you know, dog walking or pet sitting or house cleaning or being a personal assistant where you don't need a lot of startup capital and you don't need to deal with licensing issues or permitting issues or planning issues or and that kind of stuff. Absolutely. A good example here is that I had a woman in my office two weeks ago. She's about 20 years old, and she had gotten a certificate from the local Humane Society on pet care, and she was starting a dog walking business and charging $45 an hour wow. to walk dogs. And, uh, she per dog? Walk per dog. <laughs> uh, and she could walk. Now, depending on the geographic area, she could walk anywhere from six to ten dogs. Now, this is the business that is becoming increasingly regulated by uh, cities and towns and various parks. So one has to be familiar with what restrictions there are mm -hmm. and what licensing may be required. But nevertheless, that's a low-tech business that could be highly successful. So I'm just doing quick math here, and I'm not good with numbers, but that's up to 450 bucks an hour walking dogs. Isn't that unbelievable? Wow. That's pretty yeah. amazing. <laughs> well, um, so moving on here. So, the, so after the aquarium, you then went into commercial real estate. You mentioned you're a commercial real estate broker, but um, at the time, were you a commercial real estate broker when you started this? Uh, no, but immediately after I got involved, I became one. And I had done some commercial real estate investment in the past. And I liked commercial real estate as a young uh, kid, I had read that eight out of nine millionaires at that time, and this is back in the 70s, eight out of nine millionaires had made their, their millions in real estate. Mm. Uh, so that was a very good sign, and my uh, grandmother had always told me, focus on commercial real estate, not residential. It's uh, too much work, too much of a headache. And uh, so I partnered with someone in this particular case who had been in the commercial real estate brokerage industry for many years and he was very good at recruiting brokers and we offered a package to them that uh, that was pretty attractive. Uh, so we started in 1995 with just the two of us and we went from there to 30 brokers in about five years uh, in three different cities and we were able to attract successful brokers by offering them a profit sharing incentive. Uh, and uh, I think that that's critical. I, I'm able to do what I do only because I have such terrific staff at Parkway Properties, at Plasteris, and Terizzi. I've got people backing me up, uh, and if it weren't for them, I could never do this other these other things. And it's interesting that you, right from the get-go, your your business plan with Orion, and even the name, naming it Orion Partners, was geared towards bringing in the quality brokers and letting them know that it was a partnership and that they were going to share in a, in a piece of the pie and that that was the key to its growth. You know, we spent weeks on developing this particular logo that you see on the screen. It <laughs> didn't just come out of nowhere and everything in there means something. Uh, I don't want to go into tremendous detail, but you're right. The branding of any startup venture is of critical importance. Hmm. Uh, the branding has to do with not just the, the logo or the name or the presentation of the business. It has to do with the core values of the business. Uh, what is 
what, what is it that you are offering? In, in this particular case, our customers were not the people who were buying, selling, or leasing commercial property. It was actually the brokers themselves. And we called ourselves Orion Partners. We had a, a, a star behind the, the O there. We called ourselves Orion Partners because we wanted the brokers to understand that our fundamental uh, core value was that we work in partnership with them and that they are the ones who bring in the buyers and the sellers of the properties. Mm -hmm. uh, that also has uh, uh, been applied to Parkway properties where while we own and rent a number of commercial sites, we look at our tenants as partners. If they succeed, we succeed. If they don't succeed, it's our problem too. So we want to step in where appropriate and necessary and requested and, and help them with their marketing, with their uh, interior decoration, with their product placement. All of those things we, we are willing to participate in because in essence they are our partners. And uh, we have one question here from Jude who uh, wants to know why do you think that commercial is better than residential? In terms, well, I think he's saying in terms of or better or easier than residential. I think he's meaning in, in terms of uh, either management or investing in it. Well, yes, it depends upon the time, of course. Now, right now, residential prices are for homes. For instance, if one were to buy homes for investment purposes, it's a great time to do so. There are a number of of funds out there who are out purchasing foreclosed homes by the dozens or hundreds. Uh, and I anticipate that because of the price they're getting for the product, it's, it's, they're going to do quite well. But uh, I think generally commercial properties are much easier to manage. Why? Because the people that you're dealing with as tenants are there to make money. Uh, it's not their residence where they live. Uh, and uh, if they are successful, they have the money to pay the commercial rents. Uh, they are also people in business and they understand in, in a more fundamental way the relationship between landlord and tenant. They understand their obligations under the lease better. Uh, for all of those things, I think that uh, commercial property is a little bit easier to deal with. Notwithstanding that, in the current economy, actually rent, residential rent, rental properties are doing very well now. Rents are going up, at least in the Bay Area and the North Bay. Uh, in the residential area much faster than commercial rents are. And I think the reason for that is that a lot of people who've lost their homes in foreclosures or have decided to downsize are moving to uh, rental uh, residences rather than purchasing residence. And I wanted to ask you in, in terms of starting Orion, again you partnered with uh, someone else and, and it actually ended up being that you left the partnership after a while because you didn't see eye to eye with the uh, person who you'd uh, partnered with. And what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Um, well, I, I think my failure there was that I did not explore my partner's vision sufficiently to understand what he was looking for and what he expected in the long term. We both knew that we wanted to grow a business, but I didn't understand where the limits of growth were, and I don't think he understood that I was looking at this as one of uh, several investments that I was involved in and wanted to see uh, a return on the investment rather than constant expansion and development. So it's important to have these kinds of long-term discussions with your partner. Where do you want to be in five years, in ten years? What do you see the income being in five years or ten years? How much growth are we committing and, and how much money or uh, and how much of the income that we make from the business are we going to commit to future growth? If you have a fundamental difference in what the visions are, then you try to work it out ahead of time rather than finding out five to ten years down the road that, oh, I just want to keep growing and, uh, rather than keep, uh, uh, rather than providing a return for the, uh, for the partners. It's crazy to think that you know you and a partner are starting out and you haven't made a dollar yet, and to think that you have to have conversations about okay, well, if we're making two million dollars a year, you know, in in revenue uh, three years from now, 
what we would want to do with that revenue. But is it, it, it makes logical sense the way you've explained it. What we do now is we prepare a 10-year plan which we distribute to all of the investors if it's a real property or to the partners if it's a venture and, and we let them know look this is what our specific plans are if everything goes according to plan this is the way it's going to work out these are going to be the distributions this is the anticipated income and market share and so on so there's a plan that we focus on now that doesn't mean we don't constantly review it and modify it, mm -hmm. but at least we have a, a template from which to work. Okay. And so after Orion, you went on and you started your current venture, which is Parkway Properties. And uh, what did you do differently when you put together Parkway Properties compared to Orion and some of your other businesses? Well, here we, it was a different venture. Although it's still in commercial real estate, it's more of an investment and management firm. Uh, instead of brokering transactions for other people, we focus on our own transactions, our own properties, and uh, from that, uh, it, that's the primary source of our income now. Uh, while we do some commercial brokering, uh, our primary emphasis right now is on finding good properties to buy and to manage, and so we form investment groups to uh, to purchase each of these properties and this gets into what kind of legal entities to use for a particular business there are a number of uh, possibilities uh, uh, an LLC a limited liability company is the newest and easiest way to form a business venture and provide substantial protection of your personal assets from the liabilities of the business this is something that's very important to most uh, non-participant investors and to many participant investors too. But there are reasons to have a corporation under some circumstance that have to do with tax and benefits. Uh, sometimes all that's necessary is a sole proprietorship without worry about liability protection. And of course, uh, a partnership under some circumstances can accomplish the same thing that an LLC does. But again, it depends upon the needs of the particular partners in the venture. And we've got a couple of uh, questions that have come in here. Uh, Mark wanted to know, I'm not exactly sure what he means, but he says, which funds buying residential properties does Mr. Plasteris favor? Uh, I, think, I guess he's asking. Ah, okay, where... if you're asking for names, I think I need to talk to you directly. I don't, I'm not comfortable with giving out names uh, uh, over uh, a webinar. But there are funds out there. There's a number of REITs, real estate sure. investment trusts. And I can tell you this, I can tell you this. I'm heavily invested in one called Dynex, D-Y-N-E-X, which produces a 12 or 13% annual return. Uh, that is dividends paid to investors, and it's a great company. A close friend of mine, uh, ha I'm having dinner with him tonight, is the chairman of the board, and they're a uh, publicly traded company. So I, I happen to like them uh, because of the return they provide, because of the fact that most of their, their the paper that they hold, all they hold is basically commercial paper. That is to say, notes and deeds of trust and mortgages on various commercial properties. Uh, but they're, in, in many cases, they are government insured, in most cases, actually. So it's pretty safe. But uh, beyond that, I, there are other companies around that, do, that are privately held and are doing uh, purchases of, uh, uh, of, of single-family residences that have been foreclosed upon in the Bay Area. Uh, which I think is a very solid kind of investment. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people doing that now. Now, we had another question from Clayton, and uh, maybe you know what this means. He says, where does a SWOT analysis, SWOT analysis, figure into all this? Do you know what that is? I'm not, I'm not sure what he is uh, referring to. So perhaps some elaboration would Yeah, maybe us. you can elaborate with his question. Um, so uh, moving on, you, you kind of got put together kind of six lessons uh, uh, for when you're starting and, and running a business in its early days. you want to just kind of talk about that? Well, uh, yes. Uh, it's important to have expertise in the particular business. Uh, and if you don't have the expertise yourself, then try to bring in others who do. 
secondly, and this is something that lawyers uh, swear by, uh, and that's, you know, trust everyone involved, but verify all of the facts. You know, when a client comes into a lawyer, we, we hear the client's story and we accept it, but we also want to know if there are others, witnesses or documents that are going to, that are consistent with the client's version of events and the agreements involved. And so we always double check that. So it's important to go to third parties, to go to the landlord, to go to former partners of your prospective partners and make sure that you understand fully what their expertise and reliability are. Third, of course, I think it's very important in this economy to keep costs down. Don't purchase equipment, lease it. Don't buy premises, uh, lease them. Uh, keep your costs down as much as possible because you want to preserve all of your capital for operating expenses. Understand that there are going to be ups and downs in the income of any business and that oftentimes there's a honeymoon period when opening a business, particularly for instance a restaurant. The first six months restaurants usually do quite well. It's after that that there is concern uh, whether one can continue to attract not just curious customers who want to see what the new food is like, but uh, satisfied regular customers who really appreciate the value, the service, and the food. Uh, fifth, of course, is to systematize everything. Uh, there should be a, a, an employee's manual. There should be a business manual uh, that details everything. And it isn't something that is going to be cast in stone but should be frequently reviewed at least annually and revised according to changes in the market, changes in technology, changes in regulation. And finally, of course, one has to be responsive and flexible at all times. The, the, the beta curve these days is quite high and the alpha uh, curve is quite narrow. Things change quickly, uh, so one must keep on top of the industry on top of the regulation, uh, uh, on top of the market. I think it's interesting that you mentioned uh, as far as expertise goes, it could be yours or partners or an employee's as well. So, you know, you might even just be kind of an investor and you bring in a key employee. Does that put you at risk if that one, if you have, say, you know, one employee and, and you don't have any expertise? It, it depends. It could put you at risk if you have one employee with all of the expertise and it is a highly technical business. Now, one of the things that I always try to find out is, well, how many people are there out there looking for work who have the particular expertise that I need? Is it very rare to come across someone or are they quite uh, common? out there. And so if they are, I can feel more comfortable bringing in an employee that might not stay with me. But if it's a good relationship, you want to share with them the profits of the business in order to keep them uh, involved in the business and keep them uh, working hard. Incentives, I think, are all important. So we should try to incentivize our partners as well as our employees. Um, we got another question here from Timothy who says, uh, in planning a startup, what rules of thumb do you use to determine how much startup capital is needed to establish the business and tie the business over until revenues grow to a point of covering at least ongoing operated costs, operating costs? Well, that, de that depends upon the particular business. One should try to anticipate a minimum of one year's overhead and have that in reserve. Uh, add up the rent, the employment costs, and all of that, and uh, make a determination as to what it's going to be. It's going to vary tremendously from one business to the next, whether you're opening, uh, it depends on whether you're opening a, uh, a bagel shop with uh, four employees or a factory with uh, 78. Uh, so it's important to try to quantify everything in writing ahead of time. And and, there are lots of programs out there that can help us devise business plans uh, as well as an operating budget. They're pretty easy to find. And if you did have that, let's say you have that annual you know, year of, of overhead and your, your business drops off, just drops off the cliff, how, you know, at what point during that year do you pull the plug and say this, this isn't working anymore. I mean, do, should you go through that entire year and, and hope that 
there's a chance of things rebounding, or would you say, you know, three, four months of downturn, it's time to pull the plug? What are your rules of thumb on that? Well, uh, again, I think that it takes about six months for a startup business to actually comfortably start making money. So one should anticipate a minimum of six months. Now, if at the end of the six months it's still losing money, then changes have to be made. And they could run the gamut from the most extreme change of closing the business to minor changes in pricing, marketing, product placement, uh, or the type of products offered. So all of those could be uh, uh, on the table, but it, it just varies from business to business. And again, uh, you know, service business tends tend to have very low overhead because there aren't products involved, and it's just a matter of charging for the services as they are delivered and paid for. Makes things a little bit easier. In, in a, in a product-heavy business, a retail or otherwise, then one has to consider the inventory cost in addition to the operating expenses. Great. So we're um, getting near the end of the hour here. We've gone about 50-something minutes so far, and we've got a bunch of questions that people have submitted. So keep them coming, everyone, and we're gonna, we've are gonna. we just got a couple more slides here, and then we'll get to the full Q&A. But the, the next slide that uh, I wanted to show, which I think is really interesting, is because you've been involved in such a wide array of different types of industries, an aquarium, restaurant, gas station, whatnot, how you can be involved in so many different industries without really losing money. And do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, of course, uh, I think that lawyers are well qualified to generally to conduct due diligence, due diligence being a legal term that uh, it's, it's expected of everyone who invests in or starts a uh, business venture of any kind, that one would do the necessary investigation and financial analysis and otherwise to uh, ensure the, a likelihood of success in the business. And so that's, that's the skill that, uh, that I, I uh, have, I think, developed as a lawyer investigating cases and business ventures uh, all these years, and uh, I bring to any potential business venture. And actually, and one, one kind of related question to that, so for anyone who's on the call who's not a lawyer, what advice do you have for them in terms of their skill set and, and using that to their advantage of what, you know, okay. as far as their business goes? Well, first of all, it's important to discuss the business venture with the appropriate professionals. They might be lawyers, bankers, real estate brokers, CPAs, whatever, but, but have those discussions well in advance of starting the business to make sure you understand what the issues are. Secondly, if you're going into a particular field or business, try to talk to someone who is, is or has been in that business and find out what their experience is. Thirdly, crunch the numbers, crunch them again, crunch them a third time. Very important. Mm -hmm. Make sure that the overhead is not going to kill the business in its first year of operation. And uh, so you, you also mentioned bringing in partners with expertise, taking advantage of change, other, other uh, advice there as well? Well, again, you know, you're going to be relying upon others with expertise, but you need to make sure that they have the expertise and are giving you the... Uh, uh, the benefit of all their expertise. So it's important to vet your employees and partners well before uh, before committing to them. And um, taking advantage of change, we talked about that a little bit, how, how much for the legal profession things have changed since the 1970s up until today. Um, what thoughts do you, do you have on that? Well, change provides a great deal of risk in the world and it also provides a great deal of opportunity. Uh, as I said before, what we are seeing is that change is in, the pace of change is increasing faster and faster. Now, any way that you can help people or businesses either make more money or save money in this uh, changing time is going to be uh, bodes well for your success. And so, if you look at the change in a particular field and ask yourself, well, you know, people are doing, well, take printing, for example. 
these days, uh, looking back 20 years to today, the entire printing industry has changed dramatically to the point where people are printing in their own homes and uh, they have their own printers now and they can manufacture their own brochures. One company that I did invest in was uh, tremendously successful because they provided local geographic printing services for nationwide products that would incorporate local public events into the advertising. So for instance, if there's a race at, at uh, Infineon Raceway, uh, uh, liquor stores in the area would incorporate in their brochures or their, their posters in the store this upcoming event with advertising the sale of their products. Hmm. Uh, and they could do that repeatedly. It might be Mardi Gras in New Orleans. It might be uh, any local festival or event and this company was able to do that on a nationwide basis and provide individual business owners with this kind of localized advertising for national products uh, that could be incorporated uh, into their local businesses and changed with great frequency. Hmm. So this company specialized in designing the posters and then they would email them to the local businesses who would print them out themselves. It was a very low cost and rapidly changing uh, uh, advertising market. Hmm. Work, worked out quite well. Smart, yeah, smart idea. So this uh, next chart talks a little bit about um, how to choose good partners, but w what advice do you have for people who maybe want to go it alone and, and not use a partner? Well, there are advantages to going it alone, primarily complete control over the business. But one must remember that in any business venture, uh, it, it helps to have the necessary expertise to operate. Uh, and usually it's going to be a, a venture that is going to occupy all of your time for un, until it is fully up and operational. And so there are you know, there are occasions when I've gone alone on, on certain things, Parkway properties, for instance, because by then I had the expertise I needed in the commercial real estate area and in real, commercial real estate investment. But I wouldn't have done it just starting off all alone if I didn't have that expertise. Great. All right. So I think we are near the top of the hour again, and I want to get to the questions that people have submitted. But I did want to mention um, when Basil and I talked about putting this together, um, I wanted to see if there's something that we could offer to everyone who spent an hour with us um, learning about these ideas and give people an opportunity to get some extra coaching one-on-one -on -one with advice on, on their business based on Basil's background. And so I twisted his arm and um, got him to put together a couple of different uh, options here, which you can see on the screen now. Um, uh, for anyone who wants to do some one-on-one -on -one coaching with Basil, uh, there are two different levels that he offers of, of five one-hour sessions and three one-hour sessions. Um, and uh, I think this is really a great opportunity. I'm really glad you're willing to do it, Basil, because I think that um, it can be really helpful for people who are running a business today to get advice from someone who has run a number of different types of businesses. Um, so if you're interested in that, then uh, you know, go ahead and check it out. You can check it out at that website, and you can sign up right away. Um, and uh, it, you know, if not, um, then uh, that's fine as well. So. Um, I'm going to switch it over to um, questions now, and we've got a couple that have been submitted. Um, one person asked, uh, do you have any advice about what type of legal entity would be best for a coaching business? I'm particularly concerned about protecting myself from liability if a client decided, for whatever reason, to sue them. Well, that's an issue then, and it's difficult in that particular case in the real world to avoid all liability if you are the one who is personally delivering the coaching services. If you have employees who are doing that, then an LLC would be an appropriate mechanism as well as a corporation. But where it's, it's one individual who is delivering coaching services uh, and is the proprietor of the venture, then there's almost no way to escape personal liability. 
Now, what's important in the coaching is the drafting and execution of the uh, agreement with the client. And one can build in some protections there. Uh, and it's important also to manage the expectations of the client from the beginning. So I'm afraid that uh, there isn't a particular venture which is going to be highly protective of, uh, of an individual running a coaching business, but there are other things that can be done to help. And uh, another question about legal entities. Someone wanted to know um, if they wanted to buy residential foreclosures, should they form a corporation? Well, uh, that depends upon the other assets of the individual. So much of the choice about which kind of entity to use depends upon everything else going on in the life of, of the entrepreneur. If, if someone has no assets, then there isn't a whole lot to protect. Uh, and the expense of an LLC or a corporation may not be necessary at that point. It should be done later on when the business is up and operational. If, on the other hand, one has a number of assets, has a lot of equity in their home, has uh, other investments that are not retirement investments, retirement investments being exempt from liability uh, generally, uh, then uh, there is another issue to deal with there, and one has to select the right kind of entity. Again, if it's a personal services corporation where the, the owner is going to be the one delivering the services, it's going to be hard to protect against all liability. But uh, one does that in the operational agreement with the client. And another question that someone had was, how do you recommend or where do you recommend finding cheap office space for a new consulting business in urban areas? Well, uh, it depends upon the particular urban area. Uh, all real estate is local. Uh, but I recommend what is colloquially called executive suites. In fact, I have some uh, here in, uh, in Marin. And uh, what it is is basically a suite of offices that are shared by a number of different business people or professionals. And what you rent is the individual office. They may provide secretarial, photocopying, internet connection, and other services. But it's a relatively inexpensive way to start up. In addition, many of them already come furnished, so there's no furniture to purchase. Uh, there may be conference rooms and other services as well, such as even video conferencing. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a, a good way for a service kind of professional or business person. If, on the other hand, one is doing more industrial work, then I would look primarily for uh, loft space. Uh, those tend to be the least expensive space to rent. And you have to find, usually it's old factories or old buildings that have been converted to live, work, loft space. And I'll second the recommendation of executive office suites. There's one company called Regus, R-E-G-U-S, that has really gotten into this area. And, you know, with so many people, um, with the Internet and everything, people, a lot of people can work from home, work from a laptop. And I think that what we've seen over the last couple of years is people got sick of working out of a Starbucks. And um, I, I've even heard that um, you know libraries are expanding because there are more people who are self-employed or who have small bu consulting businesses and whatnot. So I think that companies like Regis take advantage of that. And I know they have um, office space, flexible office space, where you can go from anything from like just using the conference room to a couple of days or full-time office space. So it's it's a great opportunity for people who are starting businesses on a shoestring. Uh, John, if I can, I just want to uh, answer a question that had been asked early on about the SWOT analysis, SWOT, which uh, stands for the, uh, generally I think this is, what, this is what he's referring to, the specific characteristics of a business that would lend it to success, the weaknesses or limitations, the opportunities, the external chances to improve performance, and of course threats to the business itself. That's what the SWOT stood for, I believe. Ah, okay. So, and I'm afraid we don't have the time to incorporate all of that into my analysis here, perhaps yeah. a future seminar. 
Yeah. Um, let's see. And um, uh, someone else wanted to know, what if you invest in high-end residential rentals? Uh, then are the tenants easier to manage? Then I, guess. I, I, I think so. But again, uh, always with tenants, it is important to do the credit check, conduct an investigation, talk to prior landlords of that tenant, uh, obtain sufficient security from the tenant in the in terms of a deposit uh, and so on. Uh, it's also important, depending on, upon the particular property, to make sure that your lease is properly drafted to your particular building. Uh, oftentimes, those uh, form leases work quite well. In fact, I use them on occasion myself. <laughs> But there may be unusual buildings where there is shared common space or something unusual about the building that might require some additional terms or conditions that aren't contained in, uh, in a standard uh, stationary store lease. And so you have to look at that. Uh, and I would, under those cases, uh, contact a local lawyer. We have one other one other uh, question here, which uh, I think uh, might be a little tongue-in-cheek. They say, how, how do I become a dog walker? <laughs> well, I guess must like dogs to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, must must not mind door care, but it is something that people are doing now. Yeah, you know, in a, in in certain you know higher income areas where where uh, it's uh, husband and wife are in, both employed and busy, and yet they have uh, dogs. Uh, it's it's difficult to get out and walk them all the time, and so. I would look for a geographic area where there are high income uh, double employment couples with pets and start there. Yeah. And did you find out anything you mentioned about park regulations? Some parks don't, do they not allow multiple dogs or dog walkers? Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, both uh, municipalities and recreation areas are starting to impose limits on the number of dogs that one can have. Uh, there is, I know, some parks in Northern California that require the professional dog walker to have no more than six or ten dogs, and they must wear a dog walking armband that identifies them to the local authorities <laughs> as having a license to walk dogs. Wow. <laughs> that's Is that something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, well, that's interesting about that. The, the one other question we have here is, do you recommend working from home when you were starting out? I'm not sure what industry. In. Well, it depends upon the business again, but I think that if you can work from home, you should when you're starting out and save the office for later on. Now, a home isn't necessarily going to be a good thing when you are starting out as a, for instance, a, a life coach of some sort where people are going to be coming in to consult with you on a regular basis. It's just not quite as professional as an executive office may be. So uh, it depends. But if you're baking cookies, if you're mm -hmm. uh, creating a product, then you can do so at home and don't need to receive potential customers at home, then I think a home business is fine. But again, you have to check with your, your, uh, your home owners association may have restrictions that preclude mm. that. Mm. There may be zoning restrictions. And so you have to investigate that. And also you need to check to see if you need a business license. Yeah. All of these things are important and could be uh, a real problem for a business down the road. Or you can even um, sign up for one of these uh, Regis executive offices where you just use them to meet clients and just pay for a rental of the conference room uh, on that basis. Yeah, exactly. They, Regis takes care of all of the zoning issues yeah. uh, and, and also most of the technological needs of uh, uh, of individuals who are operating businesses there, so yeah, uh, you know they're a good idea for a startup. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we're out of time here, but um, thank you, Basil, for doing this. This was uh, really interesting. Oh, it's my pleasure, and I welcome any questions or comments. Great. All right. All right. Thanks, Basil. Thanks, John. Bye now.